Um, my pleasure to introduce our third and final speaker of this session. Um, Jeff uh, Cumming is a professor emeritus in psychology at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia, and the author and co-author of two statistics textbooks published by Rutledge. He's taught statistics for more than 50 years, and his statistics uh, tutorial articles and videos have been downloaded and reviewed more than 600,000 times. Very impressive. The Association for Psychological Science published six videos of his um, highly successful workshop on estimation and meta-analysis, um, and I'm sure I'd be happy to, to share the links to those. His main area of research interests are um, the investigation of statistical understanding and promotion of open science and improved statistical practices. He was a Rhodes Scholar and received his doctorate degree in experimental psychology from Oxford University. And um, excellent, you've got your slides shared there together. Um, and so I'll just, I'll pass it over to you, Jeff. Laman Jika. That's um, welcome in the language of the Jitawurung tribe, uh, people from whose land I speak to you today, about an hour outside Melbourne, Australia. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation and for joining this. This is a topic very close to my heart. It's very closely linked to what Megan talked about and Stuart talked about. I'm going to talk about the new statistics, by which I mean effect sizes, estimation and matter analysis. Of course, they're not new techniques, but for many researchers in many disciplines, uh, relying on them would indeed be new. Take home messages. I'm aiming that you will finish up uh, taking home the idea that p-values are highly unreliable, just don't trust them. Open science practices, as we've heard a fair bit about already today, are crucial, in particular planned analyses, pre-registration and planned analyses. And also I'll mention briefly our ESCII software, open source, which we'll use for the second edition of our intro stats book. Uh, which introduces and makes easy the use of the new statistics, in particular, good displays with confidence intervals. These slides are available there. And uh, actually what I should do is uh, go and put in the chat the link to the slides. There we go. Now I can come back here and go back to my slideshow, I hope. Yes, there we go. Grad students learn one thing over and over again, not in the textbooks, but that the thing that really matters is statistical significance. If you don't get that, you don't get published, you don't exist, you don't get funded, you don't get a job. And yet for more than 50 years, very distinguished scholars have excoriated significance testing and p-values. If you don't like these quotes, there are hundreds more. And this is not just people don't understand them very well, but using them actually impedes scientific progress. And even a few years ago, the grown-up statisticians came on board, eventually realizing, and here's some um, uh, the president talking about in the post P less than 05 era, we pay attention to effect sizes and confidence intervals, exactly what Megan was talking about. Indeed, and we've heard a lot about this uh, paper, famous paper in this meeting already. And my interpretation of it is that his argument is that. Um, p-values, the use of the 05 bright line criterion results in selective publication, stuff that's not significant, just isn't written up, let alone published. It leads to enormous pressure to reanalyze, to tweak, to select, to test a few more cases, drop a bit of data, whatever's necessary to get significance. And because we pay such respect to this uh, criterion, we think that if some finding makes it under that limbo bar and is published, then it's true. And we don't need to replicate. Beside, no one will publish replications, no one will fund replications. So 
uh, this is a very bad influence of using P list no five to um, govern our research. And we're in this weird situation where scholars for more than half a century have explained in great detail why it's crazy, and yet people have gone on doing it. It's the researcher's heroine. We can't approach it rationally. We're just emotionally attached to it as deeply embedded uh, in our practices, and we pass it on to our students. Now, rather than you know, trudging through all the logical reasons why it's bad, I aim to make a couple of dramatic demonstrations of just one aspect of why p-values are so uh, poisonous and um, unreliable. And that is that they vary a hell of a lot. Do a study and get a p-value, do it exactly the same again, and you get a different p-value. So I'm going to make a little uh, demo of this, the dance of the p-values. This is a simulation. We've got two populations here, two samples. Here are two means. Here's the difference between these means and the confidence interval on the difference. We drop that one down. We do another independent experiment, get oh, a surprisingly similar result. We do it again. We get a rather different result. And uh, now let's think about p-values. Uh, we do an experiment and we get a confidence interval here that just overlaps zero. So we know P is a little greater than 05, but in fact, here it is, P value for the difference. And we do it again and we get a very low note here because we get a non-significant P value because it overlaps zero even more. Another one happens to turn out to be just about zero. Next one happened to give us two stars. And here we're just under 05, one star. Oh, this sounds promising, three stars just randomly happened to be out here. was meant to run as a video, something uh, perhaps about the sink for distant viewing. I mean, that didn't quite happen like that, but these should have bounced all down the screen and you would have seen these p-values uh, unrolling one by one. Does any single confidence interval tell us about the dance? Well, remember that a researcher that's doing a study is just like closing your eyes and choosing randomly one of these lines. So you might get, for example, this confidence interval or this one. Now, these bouncing down the screen make sense. That's exactly what confidence intervals are meant to do. Any single confidence interval gives us a reasonable idea about the amount of bouncing around. We know that the next mean probably, not guaranteed, but probably will fall within our confidence interval. But now, so the width of a confidence interval tells us about the width of the dance. But does any single p-value tell us about the dance? No. Take a single value here, you've got no idea what the next value will be. You can see this running properly if you search at YouTube for dance of the p-values. And you can play with it yourself. Our colleague Gordon Moore has developed this wonderful uh, software that runs on any web browser. Uh, go to here and then you can run your own dance of the p-values. You can vary the sample sizes, the true effect size, and anything else you like. And you'll find that just about any situation, whatever the power, whatever the sample sizes, you'll get very great uh, variation, variability of p-values. Right, here's a question for you. You carry out a study and get p happens to equal exactly 0.1. You do a very careful replication, exactly the same, but with new samples. What p-value are you likely to get? Well, you won't get exactly 0.01, but think about an interval where you've got an 80% chance of your p-value landing within it. Well, think of an interval maybe from half the original to double, or perhaps even a bit wider, or be a crazy person, think even wider, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of these is correct. So how's your intuition? 
I haven't set this up as a poll. I can't give you the results, but lock yourself in. You don't need to tell anyone A, B, C, D, or E. And if you're interested in the calculations underlying this, this paper has been out there for more than a decade, lots of sites, uh, nobody's picked holes in it. And that's the basis for my calculation. Are you ready, the big reveal? In fact, the 80% interval is as wide as this. A 10% chance you'll get smaller than that, 10% more than uh, the top. And in fact, if originally you got 0.2, then here's the 80% interval. If you got 0.001, here's the 80% interval. Of course, these are smaller than up here with 0.2, but still immensely wide. Here's another demo of p-value unreliability, significance roulette. I don't have time to uh, play it, but you can find two videos that explain the basis, also based on that paper from 2008. And if you've done a study with, uh, that obtains p.05, then here are the 38 p-values that you're equally likely to get. So the bright red is three stars, and there are seven options out of 38, seven chances out of 38, 15 of dark blue. If you get 0.01, on average, the values are a little smaller, as you'd expect, but you've still got immense variation between blue and red and everything in between. Very sobering. So what researchers think they've been doing is number crunching and coming out with significant, highly significant, not significant. But in fact, what they've been doing basically is spinning the wheel. P-values are highly unreliable. Don't trust them. What's their best hope for solving the three Ioannidis problems? Open science. That um, Stuart was instrumental in helping, uh, has spent a long time helping promote, uh, setting up the Centre for Open Science in particular. In fact, Brian Nosek, the executive director and co-founder, uh, and a whole lot of colleagues published a, an article. Here's the preprint in final form in the uh, annual review of psychology of us recently that tells the story. What we need is, in brief summary, pre-registered experiments, give absolutely full details, whatever the finding, uh, open materials and data in full detail, and replications, replications, replications. So take home message number two is to escape from the poison of using significance testing, adopt open science practices. And in MRI analysis, we're particularly uh, concerned about the vast multiple comparisons um, issue, vast numbers of effects, and pre-registering planning analyses is the key thing there. Uh, we've had tons of evidence, even these la this last couple of sessions, that neuroimaging is waking up to these ideas. A key idea is the difference between exploration and planned analysis, <laughs> the dead salmon. Exploration is a vital part of science. It's why we're in it. We want to discover new things. It's exciting. But when you've got a data set, the more potential effects there are for you to look at, the more tentative any conclusion must be because of the risks of seeing clumps in the randomness. So you've got to have planned analyses, but not too many. You can't just plan to do every possible comparison because uh, if we want to have confidence, we need to have a prediction that um, is quite focused and specific and pre-register. So this is my take home number two. Uh, take home number three I'll mention briefly is uh, our software. Bob Callan Jagerman, my co-author uh, in Chicago. Here's our textbook. We're working on the second edition now. Hope it'll come out next year. And the key development from the first edition is this uh, totally revised software, ESCII, Exploratory Software for Confidence Intervals, open source in R, runs in Jamobi. Uh, it's been out there in beta form for about um, a year thousands of installs per month that's getting traction. It's quite usable now and it's available at this website like so. Uh, it runs in Jamovi, also standalone, which is a wonderful SPSS killer. 
uh, JASP is another option being developed in uh, Amsterdam. And you download the latest of this, three clicks and ESCII is installed. Uh, so let's um, do a simple example uh, here. I'm going to um, uh, quickly switch over to, can I do this? Doesn't seem to want to. Okay, I'm going to continue with my plan B, which is show you this is typical ESCII output for independent difference between two means. I've got all the data from the two groups, the males and the females. I've got the mean and 95% considerable for this group and for that group. And crucially, our research question asks about this difference. And so there it is on this difference axis, we can see it. And here's the considerable on that um, difference. And here's what we call the plausibility curve, which emphasizes that values round about the center here are your best bets of where the true value is. And it shades off both ways gradually. There's nothing particularly magical about the end of this line. And you can interpret these values exactly what Megan was talking about. You have to make a judgment whether this matters in your research context or not. And when you interpret, you each have to think about this whole interval there from almost nothing up to something perhaps quite substantial. And uh, here's uh, this is uh, uh, data from the uh, Many Labs project when uh, several dozen labs set out to replicate a single effect. And uh, here's another one with smaller samples here. And so along the confidence interval, if you wanted to get a p-value, you could eyeball it here. It's about 0.3, there it's about 0.02 or something. Uh, but who cares? You can interpret this whole interval. And who cares about these particular results? What we really need is the meta-analysis. And that shows us these results uh, from the full 36 labs. And the reason for uh, the new statistics basically is open science requires replication, which requires integration of evidence over studies, meta-analysis. And meta-analysis requires estimation. Here are point and interval estimates and p-values and NHST, just totally irrelevant. The new statistics, I've been teaching it to intro students for a long time. It's such a pleasure because people who haven't been tainted by the heroin yet, just get it. The whole idea of open science and open data and replication totally natural. Forest plots for meta-analysis, totally natural. And of course, we can teach them about fee values and significance testing and their dangers, but they, with luck, will not get infected. Uh, a few uh, references for some papers of ours uh, recently explaining the new statistics and how to get on with it. And finally, my take home messages again, my slides are here and that link is in the chat. And here are a few take home images as well. And the second edition of this book we would humbly put forward is the way that people should be introduced to their statistics these days in whatever discipline. The uh, new statistics greeting, may all your confidence intervals be short. Great. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate the, that you're able to share so many of your teaching and other resources that you've developed with the community. So thank you. Um, I wanted to point uh, all the speakers to a question in the Q&A. Um, and then there's also a question specific to this talk, um, Jeff, in the chat. So I'll read that one now. So it says, thanks for a great talk. I have a question. If p-values are not reliable, what should we use in order to decide what studies are worth replicating? Because without enough replications, we can't do the meta-analysis. Uh, indeed. One of the key things about um, pre-registration and publication, no matter what the results are, is that decisions about um, publication should be taken before we know the data. And these are called registered reports. The idea is you 
dream up a good study, you do lots of pilot tests, you figure out uh, exactly what you want to do, you pre-register it, then you submit the pre-registration to a journal. It's no doubt reviewed and that's great. You get um, uh, expert advice before you commit yourself to doing the study and you tweak your pre-registration. Then when the journal's happy, they say, right, we're going to publish this uh, no matter what results you get, just provided you follow uh, the uh, protocol you've specified and you report it in full detail. So then you go out and do it. Now, what's worth replicating should be um, similar. We should examine the, uh, no, not quite the same, I guess. We examine the study, but primarily we're making a judgment about, is this question worth studying from a research point of view? Do I really wish to know the answer? And then if the answer is yes, and you've got all the resources and so on and so on, and you're interested enough, well, uh, submit a, uh, uh, a protocol for pre-registration. And if that's accepted, uh, then you've got a publication, you've got the uh, go ahead from the expert referees to go and do it. And whatever you get, whether it's highly disappointing or enormously exciting, if you've done it competently, then we've got to have those results out there. And so you're duty bound to um, uh, report them. If you don't use the, uh, um, the registered report, well, you do a study and you get some results, maybe it won't get into science or nature because they still insist on having highly sexy and new and different things, but you're duty bound to make it available on one of the numerous um, uh, public archives of, um, of findings so that when people come to do a meta-analysis, on that topic, they can find it. And uh, of course, one of the big poisonous things that p-values have done is to lead to publication bias, which means that meta-analyses uh, have in the past been highly skewed towards results that happen to be positive, happen to be significant. And so they give overestimates of effect sizes. And that's um, a very well-recognized problem in the Cochrane collaboration, for example, but we still need to keep pressing these open science practices. That's the answer. All right. Thank you. Easier said than done, I know. <laughs>